come on, when are you going to do Dark Souls? Can you do that on your channel? One of the best games ever. How have you not even played any Dark Souls? So we should definitely check out Dark Souls. You should really be playing Dark Souls. How have you not played Dark Souls? So you're going to play the game and suck it up and play I like my Dark Souls with extra pain. You don't know what you're missing. Could you play Dark Souls next? I really want to see you miserable. Okay, fine! I'll play Dark Souls! Who are you talking to? How did it take me until 2022 to finally get around to playing Dark Souls? Now I can really feel this game's inspiration affecting so many others I've played, like Code Vein, Hollow Knight, and Blasphemous. Well, you can't exactly call Dark Souls a Souls-like, so what is Dark Souls? A Metroidvania. I, what? Yeah, it's a textbook open-world lock-and-key Metroidvania, but modern-day uneducated dweebs instead use Souls-like to mean brutally difficult. Well, we can't just have a game's name as a genre that actually means another game's name as a genre. Difficulty is not a genre! Dark Souls is a dark fantasy 3D open world game where you venture through an ever-expanding dangerous series of environments, unlocking new interconnecting pathways and fighting challenging enemies and bosses to eventually make your way to open a secret hidden room and defeat the final boss. A Metroidvania. Well, what sets it apart from others of the genre is its unique XP system. When you defeat enemies, you're awarded with souls for killing them, which you can spend at bonfires to level up like regular XP, or you can spend them at merchants like currency. But if you die, and believe me, you will, you'll be brought back to life at the last bonfire you rested at after losing all of your acquired and unspent souls at the place where you ate it. You'll need to safely make your way back to that dangerous location in order to retrieve your lost souls. But if you die along the way, they're gone forever. So if you're ever afraid of losing a ton of unspent souls, you can always use a limited homeward bone item to warp back to the safety of a bonfire. But keep in mind that once you rest at a bonfire, you also respawn all defeated enemies. So what the game is really all about is slowly but surely pushing onwards into mysterious and treacherous unmapped territory while constantly gauging that risk to reward decision of playing it safe and retreating or continuing onwards into the unknown. And the kicker is there is no map whatsoever, so you'll never know if pushing onwards would lead you into a deadly ambush or the warm embrace of one of the game's few and far between bonfires to rest at. You can try to go by online fan-made maps, but the massive interlinking 3D environment just doesn't translate well to 2D at all. And I'm kind of glad because this only adds to the fear, mystery, and immersion of the game. Though the massive world is dangerous and full of traps, it's also loaded with tools and treasures to aid you in your survival, like various upgradable armor, and medieval dark fantasy weapons, as well as rings to offer unique buffs, merchants, weaponsmiths, and even summonable NPCs to aid you in difficult boss encounters. But you can't just go equipping all your strongest stuff and expect to be safe, as you'll quickly discover the game's stamina and equipment load systems. You can only move as fast as your muscles can physically carry you, so equipping too many heavy items can cause you to run and dodge like a drunk slug in peanut butter. But too many lightweight items will almost assuredly provide the defense of one ply office toilet paper, so you've got to find your balance. So if you find an amazing armor set that makes you feel extra tanky, be prepared to put down your heavy sword and shield to compensate for all that weight, maybe taking up a bow or a rapier instead. It's either that or you've got to raise your max equipment load and level up your endurance. When you spend your souls to level up at a bonfire, you select which of your base stats to increase, which results in raising several others related to that stat. Aside from the obvious benefit of simply having high stats, some weapons will actually have stat minimum requirements in order to even wield them properly. So you can't just raise your vitality and endurance and expect to wield that Black Knight halberd or Dragon's Tooth you found without first investing in strength. The game doesn't exactly tell you that though, leaving it up to surprise for the player to discover and investigate on their own. Through trial and error, I learned that having more than half of your max equipment load makes you that super slow heavy class, so avoid that at all costs. Another big mechanic the game coyly hands you without proper explanation is humanity, which is a physical item you'll accumulate on your quest and spend in order to reverse your undead hollowing and become a human again. Though you can easily play the entire game hollow, being a human actually does a lot of things. Based on how much humanity you have, you will be given better item drop rates from enemies. It's also the only way to summon NPCs or even real players to assist you in boss battles. Yeah, you heard him right. There's multiplayer in this game, and for being a single-player focused game, I have to say that Dark Souls has the absolute 
best multiplayer integration I've ever experienced in a video game. Think of the entire game world as a single layer in a complex series of parallel dimensions inhabited by other players. As you happen to pass each other on your journeys, you'll see each other in the form of ghosts in real time momentarily as they go about their business. You can even interact with these other worlds by inscribing messages on the ground anywhere, warning them of impending danger, or cluing them into hidden secrets or treasure, or straight up lying to them. It's due to this collective strangers helping strangers mechanic that'll keep you better immersed and away from walkthroughs. We also mentioned that if you're human, you can summon ready players into your own game world to help you defeat bosses, or elect to be summonable yourself to pass the torch onto others. However, if you wander around as a human for too long, you'll be open to being invaded by players, or even some preset NPC characters to keep you on your toes. Luckily, my experience with the Dark Souls community was hardly trolly at all, with good advice, helpful, willing allies, and little to no deception or invaders. This hands-off world design on the part of the developers allows the community to immerse themselves intimately in the game, becoming their own hint and assistance system through cooperative support. However, every character's build and stats will be different, making every interaction unique, even in ghostly passing. When you first start the game, you'll select one of many classes like Warrior, Pyromancer, or Nudist, which all have their own starting gear and variances and stats. However, you can eventually level up any starting class into whatever you want. It's largely just determining like how you want to start your own game and not exactly how you want to get locked into later on. But the main mechanic absolutely dominating every part of this game is stamina. Your stamina meter is depleted for absolutely everything you do, like running, dodging, attacking, and blocking. Shielding even prevents your stamina from recovering as long as you're holding it. This means that when you're in a scrap with a tough enemy or a boss, you need to carefully manage when to spend that precious stamina attacking, blocking, or running away, dodging, and most of all, letting down your guard, allowing that gauge to recharge. Because without stamina, you're a sitting duck, unable to block or even escape. All this together makes Dark Souls hard. But it's only hard because these mechanics are all based on reality. Weapons and armor are heavy. You can't sprint and dodge continuously without a rest, and fire, lightning, spikes, blades, and giant freaking hammers hurt a lot. And it's because it's so hard that this game is indescribably rewarding when you finally overcome that powerful boss or long gauntlet uncovering the next precious bonfire. I can't honestly tell you how many games made me jump up and shout in celebration even half as much as this game did. Because the rest of the time I was laughing out loud at how ridiculously brutal the game design was. With cruel enemy placement, borderline unfair terrain maneuvering, and unjustifiably painful bosses. <laughs> I actually laughed so hard, I nearly choked in the very beginning of the game after walking through the first corridor with tutorial messages on the ground telling me how to block and attack against passive, non-aggressive enemies. Whereupon I enter the first room and SLAM! A massive final boss tier demon crashes down and proceeds to impale my freshly powdered quivering anus with its 15 ton colossal hammer. <laughs> I laughed so hard, I was in tears! Like, like this game is a joke, right? Because it was at that moment that I knew painfully well what this game really was. <laughs> it's amazing! Okay. We need to talk about how absolutely incredible this game looks. Undoubtedly, it's some top-tier PS3 graphics and design. Even though you think you've seen it all with Dark Fantasy, Dark Souls is so uniquely its own thing that it manages to stand out predominantly from the rest with its own creatures and expansive world designs. And the absolute coolest thing about it is the fact that there is only a loading screen when you die and warp back to the bonfire. This entire preposterously massive world doesn't even have loading zones! I never even noticed a single instance of frames dropping from this obviously taxing feat of graphical engineering either. The bosses look amazing, hitboxes feel fair, the world itself is gorgeous, and each locale has its own visual flair to help it remind you of where you are so you can find your way. One of the coolest moments in the game for me was after I had spent hours setting off from Firelink Shrine and exploring the catacombs, New Londo, and Undead Burg, leading me up to the lofty parish, defeating a couple bosses along the way, and stumbling upon an elevator that descended me straight down, connecting right back to Firelink Shrine. 
I had no idea that after all that exploring and progress that I was somehow directly above my starting point. It's like the game has you lost and afraid for so long that discovering a new route back to safety or familiarity is an overwhelmingly amazing experience, and a loading screen would have destroyed that moment. At least that was my experience playing the remastered port on Nintendo Switch where I was stuck on the loading screen for hours like an idiot. Dark Souls is so hard, I can't beat the main menu. Until I finally discovered that From Software swapped the A and B buttons without any notice and prevented players from remapping them to the correct layout, forcing me to manually remap them in the Switch settings just to play the game. Hey, at least we beat the menu. I probably am just an idiot. The story in Dark Souls is simultaneously subtle and deep in its storytelling and lore, as Metroidvanias tend to be. The game begins with a hollowing undead, escaping from an asylum and taking on a seemingly hopeless prophesized quest from a dying inmate, claiming to have heard that one day an undead will be chosen and brought to the decadent land of Lord Dran and ring the bell of awakening. Though he doesn't exactly know what it means or anything, or even what it's worth, but he just thinks it's kind of neat. But simply having a goal is enough to set you off on a quest to ring that bell, dang it! Yeah, and then you immediately find out that there's actually two bells. Huh, I, a small oversight, I'm sure. And the bells are very far away from each other. <clears throat> well, I mean, he was still kind of right. Which, upon being wrong, will open the gates to Sen's fortress. Well, I don't know what that is, but it must be great after all this work! It's a funhouse of death traps, giant boulders, swinging blades, and 12-foot snake warriors guarding the entrance to the lofty palace and Orlando. Wasn't exactly on the agenda, but it's okay. I'm sure it's all gonna be okay. And it's within Anor Orlando that the Chosen Undead will acquire the Lord Vessel from Big Titty Lady and warp back to Firelink Shrine to begin the second half of their quest. <laughs> what? Is this still about ringing a bell? Because this is starting to smell like wild goose to me. The story up to this point has been mostly told through atmospheric lore and absorbed from NPC characters, giving you a disturbing look at this doomed kingdom's inhabitants. But one character changes all of that quite suddenly after ringing the bells, giving you a clear objective and reason behind your quest. The giant goblin snake guy? Yes, the giant goblin snake guy. Yeah. King Seeker Frampt awakens with the sound of the bells and instructs the chosen undead to retrieve the Lord Vessel and fill it with the souls of the most powerful lords of the land and offer them up as a sacrifice in order to enter the sealed throne room of Gwyn, Lord of Cinder, and dethrone him. After finally slaying Lord Gwyn the Chosen Undead lights the final bonfire and connects the flames across the land. However, long story short, this merely is delaying the inevitable, as one day there will still be an end to the Age of Fire. Especially curious players, however, might end up stumbling across another world serpent named Darkstalker Koth. Though his aim is similar to Framps, tempting the Chosen Undead to also gather the Lord's souls and light the Lord Vessel to find and defeat Lord Gwyn, Koth divulges secret information he describes as the truth that Framps neglected to tell you, making following his path instead of Framps morally ambiguous. Koth instead Ned wishes for you to slay Gwyn and extinguish the fire, bringing about a new age of dark and take up the moniker as the Dark Lord. He tells you that this is your destiny as you are actually the descendant of an ancient being that once held the powerful Dark Soul and is awaiting the end of the Age of Fire, which is something that Gwyn greatly fears. So do you like bad ending A or bad ending B? Because honestly I can't decide between pointlessly delaying the inevitable or snuffing out all fire in the land and ruling as the fourth Lord of Darkness. But honestly, forget all of that. Sure, that's what happens, but the story is so much more than that. It's about being on a journey with a doomed quest and having nothing keeping you going but your own determination. And along this journey, you'll meet and interact with this land's few surviving characters with whom you can help out and save or kill on the spot or watch them slowly descend into depression and madness. One guy straight up got so frustrated with me always talking and asking him questions that he later ambushed me and tried to kill me. Now that I can relate to. Is there one? Most of this game is actually quiet, with only the sounds of your footsteps and unironically sexualized groans of pain keeping you company. That is, until you encounter a boss and everything goes from zero to a hundred in a heartbeat. The fact that there's no music, but instead atmospheric sound effects for most of the game makes the sheer impact of the boss music all the more extreme. That on top of the fact that the music itself is absolutely magnificent. However, my favorite musical inclusion to the game is when a player rings one of their two bells. Not only is that well-earned glorious gong resonating through their game world, but it also echoes across all other games at that exact moment. So whenever you're in the thick of things and feeling overwhelmed or weak, and you hear that bell, 
fills you with encouragement and newfound strength to persevere until you can ring that mighty bell yourself. And if they could do it, then so can you. You go, man, you did it, and I'm gonna be next. I thought for sure your favorite part would have been the sexy groans you make when you take damage. Oh, oh, oh. Honestly, what's that about? Even the Chosen Undead loves this game so much he can't contain himself. Oh, oh. So many games these days try their best to copy Dark Souls' homework and replicate the experience themselves. And I've played my fair share, but none of them hold a candle to the original. Had anybody honestly just told me that Dark Souls was a Metroidvania, I'd have signed up a decade ago. The best part about jumping into this franchise so late is that there's so much more I want to play now! Elden Ring and Bloodborne and Demon Souls, not to mention Dark Souls 2 and 3. There's that, but there's also this New Game Plus thing tempting me to play it all over again, like... Oh, oh. The positive gamer in me went from an ignorant moron to a full-blown fan after playing Dark Souls, giving it a powerful 10 out of 10! No other game I've ever played felt like a true test from the developers to the gamers, but the beauty in Dark Souls is in accepting that challenge, never giving up, and holding firm to finally come out on top. It's truly an indescribable experience that everyone should try at some point. The critical gamer in me didn't think twice in kindling Dark Souls with a well-deserved 10 out of 10. This game deserves every single word of praise it has ever gotten and more, where my only misgiving with the game being that I didn't play it sooner. This game was so undeniably radiant. If only I could become so grossly incandescent. But what do you think? Tell us how your positive and critical sides rate Dark Souls in the comments below. Dark Souls is easily one of the best and most important video games ever made. And if you're avoiding it just because of its reputation and difficulty, then you're just playing with yourself. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to like and subscribe for more and use the links in the description to nominate your own episode. And thank you to all of our Patreon members, Atomic Thomas, Arrow, Minya, and Sid. We need some more people in Patreon. Please, guys, help me make these videos. They're really hard. They take a lot of work. I mean, I really appreciate everybody in Patreon. I do, obviously, but unfortunately, we've been losing some lately. And, you know, it's over time. People grow out of things, but it's just really hard to keep making these. So, you know, long story short, support me on Patreon, guys. You can do it for as little as a dollar, and it helps these videos immensely. But either way, that is all I got for you guys. I'll see you next time. Boop!